Foster, please, to take your seats. Well, a very hearty welcome to all of you, friends, colleagues, partners. Um, this is the eighth Malaria Day celebration, so to speak. Um, uh, it takes place, as you all know, uh, in a very special year, 2015, when a new world agenda for sustainable development will be decided and where malaria, among all the health challenges that we need to pursue, you know, will have its place. Um, this is kind of the community working for this, so you all know that it's pretty clear that uh, what we need to increase coverage, better innovation, reaching the unreached, and the commitment of resources and, and political commitment to do so. So we're really happy to, it's important to come together and to exchange the information, exchange the key asks, and that's what we do uh, today. Um, uh, welcome again. Uh, we have the pleasure uh, here uh, to have for the introduction our executive director. My name is Christian Salazar. I'm UNICEF's deputy director of programs. I will take you through the next one and a half hours. And without further ado, may I um, hand over the word to Mr. Antony Lake, our beloved executive director. Please. Thank you very much, Christian. AID. Thank you for being here, Pedro Alonso. Uh, I was going to welcome you and tell you how much I admired everything you have done, both in your vision and in your work on malaria and vaccines, and especially in reaching the most disadvantaged. But it all got wiped out because we just had a conversation in my office and I discovered that he is a Real Madrid fan. Uh, so it, 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 it is with some difficulty that I welcome you to the uh, House. Uh, I've been working on uh, behalf of World uh, Malaria Day on April 25th uh, since this morning. My first meeting was the development minister with the development minister of Australia, and I said to him uh, that we're only what is it 10 days away uh, from World uh, Malaria Day, uh, and uh, so you do know. Well, actually, what I said was you do know what that April 25th is an important day. And he said, Yes, I do. I thought, this is great, you're making progress, the development minister is already getting ready to celebrate. Uh, and then he said, of course, it's Anzac Day, the 99th anniversary of the Australian and New Zealand forces fighting in World War I. And I said, well, try not to be too dismissive. Uh, I said, well, that's fantastic. And so we agreed, I will celebrate Anzac Day also, and he is going to celebrate World uh, Malaria Day. So if we want grants from Australia, we might pick that day to, uh, to go to him. Anyway, let me, let me uh, this is a big deal, and I'm so glad you're all here and, and welcome. And let me begin with just a few facts, uh, all of which you know, but I think uh, provide a really compelling case uh, for uh, calling attention to, as Paper and I were just discussing, uh, an issue that is in a way one of those wonderful issues where you can tell people things that they didn't know and then they say, oh, yes, of course, that's more important than I had uh, realized. Uh, one of those facts is that every year uh, 10,000 pregnant women die of malaria. Uh, and uh, every year up to an estimated 200,000 infants die uh, probably because the mothers uh, were infected by malaria. Uh, and those are appalling, not just numbers, uh, but loss of very human uh, lives. Uh, and the point is that pregnant women uh, who have malaria then, as you know, uh, are more susceptible to anemia, passing it along to the infants, uh, to early uh, uh, birth, uh, premature birth, et cetera, uh, et cetera. What's really frustrating uh, is that uh, IPTP and ITNs, bed nets, can prevent this. And what's even more frustrating is that they don't cost all that much. And this is extremely cost-effective uh, way of dealing with a uh, major uh, problem. And what's outrageous 
uh, is the inequities in how uh, women are receiving this uh, protection. Uh, that uh, four out of 10 women, I believe it is, uh, receive the antenatal uh, uh, protection and counseling they need uh, in the rural areas and seven out of 10 uh, in the uh, urban areas, uh, which is, as I said, outrageous and overall, uh, just over a third of women, 38% of women, uh, receive the uh, protection uh, at all. So that's all wrong. Uh, and these facts should be, for anybody who listens, a call to action. Uh, we know how to deal with this. We know what to do. Uh, we can do it. It is cost effective to do it. And therefore, there is no moral or practical excuse for the world not to do it. So I'm looking forward to you all discussing uh, in, this, in this meeting how we can all better uh, advocate for uh, IPTP to be uh, and ITNs to be part of uh, not just national strategies, but a funded part of national strategies in their budgets how we can support communications campaigns that can get the word out uh, to uh, pregnant women uh, about what is available to them to protect themselves uh, and their children. Uh, how we can find innovative ways to help the poorest women get to the care centers where they can get uh, this treatment and counseling uh, through vouchers or uh, in other uh, ways. Uh, and how, of course, then we can help equip the centers and train the staffs uh, to provide all of this. This is tremendously important, uh, not only because addressing malaria is one of the keys to achieving the SDGs uh, or the every newborn uh, targets for respectively 2030 or 2035, uh, but also just because we are talking about so many lives. Uh, I was very struck uh, by the estimate uh, that we could have saved 200,000 neonatal lives uh, between 2009 and 2012. I believe that, yeah, uh, right, 200,000. Every one of them could be now a child and a future, like my grandchildren uh, and their futures. So this is a wonderful uh, practical cause and even more a wonderful moral cause when you think of all those uh, children who are not alive today. So thank you. I hope you have a wonderful meeting. Uh, I hope you will deeply reconsider your allegiances. Uh, and uh, I'm going to sit as for as long as I can and listen and learn. And thank you. Uh, thanks very much for this uh, introduction. Also, particularly, I know you are uh, about to depart to Washington for the spring meeting to the World Bank with quite a tough schedule. So, it's really especially appreciate that you took the time to be here this morning. And without further ado, I'll ask my colleague Agbesi Muzu, he's uh, in our data and analytics uh, unit, uh, to talk about burden of disease and coverage and the data we have supporting all of this. Please, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let me also take the opportunity to uh, welcome you here. 
to this important event. My name is Agbesi Yamuzo. I uh, sit within the data and analytics sections here at UNICEF. I'm um, very pleased uh, to be able to walk you through some of the latest data on, uh, on malaria. And uh, 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 before I, I jump into the burden and intervention coverage, uh, since I won't be able to cover everything, uh, I would like to uh, also direct you to some of the resources that we have here in terms of data uh, on, uh, on malaria that we compiled here uh, within, uh, within uh, uh, UNICEF. And then I will talk a little bit about burden and intervention coverage and disparities without really elaborating because I have other people, a presenter coming who will elaborate more. Um, so <coughs> we, we support, as many of you know, uh, many countries, over 100 countries in the implementation of the multiple individual cluster surveys to allow national uh, represent, nationally representative surveys that collect data on uh, various topics, including malaria. Uh, and we have uh, uh, malaria modules that ask questions on prevention, uh, diagnosis, and treatment, especially among children under five. And, and, and so, but uh, beyond that, we work with our country offices to identify all sources of uh, data in my area from nationally representative surveys, uh, DHS surveys, or malaria indicator surveys, or other national surveys, and we compile those data to, to databases that are uh, updated regularly and, uh, and, uh, and released publicly on the web. So uh, some of you may have already uh, had access to those databases. Uh, but they are, uh, se there are several indicators, including internationally agreed uh, indicators on malaria that uh, uh, are extensively used uh, globally for monitoring uh, malaria uh, uh, as well as other programs. Um, they are used, for example, for MDG uh, progress report, the RBM uh, Broadback Malaria Progress and uh, Impact Series, uh, UNICEF reports, uh, for example, the state of the children, the world uh, children, um, Countdown, a global initiative for monitor coverage, and, uh, and, and some other uh, uh, initiative um, and by, implemented by government partners, um, academics, and the, the larger public. So, so if you are interested in those data or you need data on coverage of some of these indicators, we invite you to log on or to go on www.data.unicef.org where you will be able to access and download <coughs> free of charge all these databases uh, for your, your, your analysis. So um, in terms of burden and progress, as you all know, Malaria remains uh, uh, a disease that we, we all worry about. If you uh, come from Sub-Saharan Africa like, like me, or uh, you're traveling to Sub-Saharan Africa, you, I'm sure you have on your list how to avoid, how to prevent, uh, uh, avoid malaria. So it's a disease that we, we care about, and it's a, a, a disease of high burden. WHO estimated that uh, in 2013 alone, close to 200 million cases occurred, which led to about 600,000 uh, deaths. And those deaths are mostly in sub Saharan in Africa. With, and uh, children under five pay the largest uh, tribute to, uh, uh, with uh, close to 80 percent of these deaths occurring in children under five. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa alone, where close to uh, the majority of the deaths occur and the burden exist, 14% uh, of deaths in children under five uh, are due to malaria. And this 
uh, uh, varies, the overall varies across countries, reaching 20% in some of the countries, where, which you can see in the, in the dark, uh, 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 the darker color in, uh, in uh, uh, the map, on the map. So, however, with this uh, high burden and, uh, and some hot dark pictures, it's not uh, entirely dark because there's hope and substantial progress has been made in the past 15 years or so due to massive scale up of uh, interventions, preventive interventions, diagnosis, and treatment. We are able to reduce this in children under 5 by 40% between 2000 uh, and 2013. And, and uh, 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 estimate from the bridge also estimate uh, show that between 2001 and 2013, we have uh, been able to save 4.3 million lives. Uh, and and 92% of these in children under 5. So tremendous progress has been achieved. Uh, uh, but a lot more I mean, to be done. So, let me um, talk a little bit about what has been done in terms of coverage. I will focus mainly on preventive interventions, uh, not going too much on, uh, on, on uh, uh, treatment or management, uh, case management. But um, the massive uh, scale up of uh, insecticide treated and net in, since 2000s resulted in also a large increase in the use of IT net by children under five. And the map here shows you side by side how trends have moved over time. Uh, and and uh, the, you will see how countries have become um, with darker scope, color, meaning that coverage has increased, and particularly in countries such as Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Malawi, uh, Madagascar, Benin, and Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, coverage in the use of ITN by children under five has uh, gone beyond over 50%. However, in many countries, coverage remains under 50% and need to be uh, increased. Um, so, as uh, uh, Secretary Director mentioned, um, IPTP, Intermittent Preventive uh, Treatment, is one of the active interventions to prevent malaria in pregnancy. Malaria in pregnancy is uh, 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 essential, uh, preventing malaria in pregnancy is essential because of the adverse outcomes to the pregnancy, to the mother or the, or the the baby. So, WHO recommend that IPTP be provided during antenatal care visits, and, and it consists of those consists of doses provided to the mother, dispensed to the mother when she uh, makes such antenatal visits. The chart here shows you uh, countries in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that uh, uh, are providing IPTP. And the coverage of IPTP in these countries, which we can see has increased uh, over time from since 2000. Uh, however, they remain uh, uh, low in most countries. We could commend countries such as uh, Gambia, Ghana, and Zambia, for example, where the coverage had reached over two thirds of, uh, of pregnant mothers. Um, but uh, in the uh, uh, majority of the countries, coverage remained under uh, 30% or so. So, to the point that we uh, estimated that about three quarters of mothers are not being pro are not protected entirely uh, in pregnancy or <coughs> malaria. Now, because IPTP is delivered. Uh, to during antenatal care and uh, successive visits, we looked at the proportion of women who imported having received 
four or more visits, which is a recommendation now from the page to uh, get at least four visits during pregnancy. Uh, then, if all these women receive with the uh, IPTP or the doses to prevent pregnancy, we should expect that the proportion of women who had at least four visits, antenatal visits, should be fairly equal to the proportion that have received IPTP. Well, the graph, this graph showing you on the x-axis the proportion that have received four in ANC visit and the proportion has, that have had IT, IPTP on the y-axis, showing that the proportion receiving four or more antenatal visits is much larger than the, uh, those receiving uh, IPTP. That means that even though many women have reached uh, the health systems, have made up to four visits, they still do not get the uh, doses of uh, uh, IPTP that they need to prevent the, uh, malaria during the pregnancies. So the opportunity to deliver the interventions, even when the woman is present, are being missed and, and, and need to uh, uh, be uh, considered for if we want to increase uh, the coverage of IPTP. Not only that, if we look at um, coverage of antenatal care, well, most women receive at least one visit of uh, antenatal care, but Less than 50% across Sub-Saharan Africa, on average, receive four or more visits of antenatal care. So they, uh, there's a need not only to maximize the opportunities for women that are coming, but also to increase the coverage of antenatal care given the IPTP is delivered within the framework of antenatal care. So it's important that both uh, dimensions be taken into consideration. We looked at the uh, equity. So the red is the poorest and the rich is the, 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 the blue is the richest. And you could see in most countries, we still have a gap with the uh, 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 poorest fairly, uh, the richest fairly much better than the poorest women in the receipt of IPTP. Now, I want to point out that the two countries at the end, which are Gambia and Ghana, where coverage is high, I mean, over 60%, uh, uh, and there's no gap between the poorest and the richest. So these two countries must be doing something right and, and probably need to uh, be documented and follow more. Uh, but you could see uh, the widest gap in some of the countries that remain to be closed. Now, the other uh, preventive method is the ITN use by pregnant women. And we looked at a uh, proportion of women who receive food or the use in ITN during pregnancy. And the graph shows you Again, the same, pretty much similar story. Uh, you know, due to effort uh, that are happening in countries, coverage has increased, but many countries also are lagging way behind with uh, uh, low, uh, fairly low coverage. Some countries have done tremendously well with coverage reaching over uh, close to 75 percent. Uh, countries such as Rwanda, uh, Benin, Tanzania. Cell, which really seems to be doing fairly well. Now, there is an interesting story that we should also uh, celebrate as a success in the sense that when efforts are made and poorest uh, population if are reached with distribution of uh, ITN, what we you start seeing is that even the more the poorest population, the rural population, the proportion of the uh, percentage of women using the, uh, uh, the ITN 
can even higher than among the richest population. So yet we see that um, the poorest being the yellow and the, uh, the richest being the blue. The blue is in uh, below the the yellow in many of these countries, showing that really we've really done quite well. We're doing quite well in reaching those uh, poorest women with ITN. We just need to make sure that all of them are being reached to in order to increase coverage. So uh, I think my time is up. So I'm just going to summarize here to also highlight the tremendous progress that has been made over the past 15 years in terms of reduction of the, the burden, in terms of mortality, uh, general mortality, and uh, mortality among children under five. But the challenges remain reaching uh, uh, pregnant women and children uh, with uh, the intervention in order to increase coverage and targeting these uh, uh, groups within the whole universal healthcare uh, uh, strategy. These must not be left out. Now, this progress have, been, have happened due because of funding, and fundings continue to continue uh, uh, in order to, for the momentum to be kept and to be accelerated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. Um, our next speaker, I don't think, needs really an introduction. I know everybody, everybody here and beyond the room. Pedro Alonso, WHO's uh, Director of the Global Malaya Program. Please, Pedro Alonso. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, clearly, the passion for malaria and maternal and newborn and uh, child health is must be one of the most powerful forces that brings us together and that can even allow us to overcome the deepest of divides between a Barca supporter and a Real Madrid supporter. Um, so I'm delighted to be here um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to uh, uh, share with you some data, some partly already presented um, and um, uh, a bit of a sense of where we are trying to be uh, moving forward over the next um, uh, few years. So, um, I presume it's just the uh, next slide. Right, so, uh, I'll try to over the next uh, few minutes review um, the progress over the last decade partly already covered by my uh, predecessor uh, here today and uh, and and and, and, um, and where we're where we're going where we're going next. So by large data contained in the World Malaria Report that we released in December this last year in 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 in, in London and um, essentially recognizing the um, the uh, progress uh, achieved over the last, we often say last decade, it's truly the last uh, uh, 13 years, and the big numbers are uh, basically this one's uh, uh, mortality rates reduced by, by, by about half, uh, uh, a very significant proportion of these deaths um, uh, prevented have taken place in, in, in Africa, particularly among uh, under five African uh, children, incidence of clinical episodes down by about 30% uh, and altogether since the year 2000 an estimated 4 million lives saved. We often term these unprecedented um, gains, uh, unprecedented results and I believe they, they truly are. Uh, as many of you will remember, the uh, world embarked in a malaria eradication campaign launched uh, in the 1955 World Health Assembly in uh, Mexico City. Community still uh, discusses whether that was a success or a failure 
and uh, a slightly sterile discussion. Uh, the truth of the matter is that indeed malaria was eliminated in some countries, but the depth of the gains that we've witnessed over the last 13 years are probably more profound than the gains that we observed during the, the past eradication uh, campaign. Campaign that was um, never uh, um, closed down, uh, the 1968 World Health Assembly actually called for or recognized that the goal of eradication was not achievable in the short term, but we never actually gave up on the final goal of eradication. So technically speaking, WHO's goal is still malaria uh, eradication. We often use the term uh, malaria-free world, um, um, but truly uh, that's, that's what it means. So phenomenal pro progress made over the last, um, over the last um, uh, decade, probably uh, attributable to three major elements. The first one is that the community did recognize that malaria is both a global health challenge and an impediment to economic development. Secondly, that new and better tools were developed by and large in the latter part of the 1980s and during the 1990s, both in terms of uh, uh, treated bed nets, new antimalarial drugs, rapid diagnostic tests, and then thirdly, the uh, uh, substantial scale up uh, of, of the core uh, interventions that has already been alluded to and that I'll uh, briefly dwell on in just a minute. So, drops in, the, in, uh, um, in um, uh, malaria incidence, the figure on your left, uh, drops in uh, malaria mortality rates, the drops in your uh, Right. So, indeed, uh, as we mentioned just a minute ago, between 2000 and 2013, estimated mortality rates fell by 47% in all age groups and by 53% in the children under five. If trends continue, malaria mortality rates by the end of 2015 are projected to have decreased by 55% in all age groups and by 61% in children under five. Indeed, once again, historical improvements. Figures or graphs like this one may actually um, hide significant heterogeneity, but what this uh, map um, shows is that um, the percentage change in malaria mortality rates between 2000 and 2013, and essentially, um, if you're on the blue, uh, bluer, uh, th those are decreases at least uh, of 75 percent in the orange between 25 and 75 percent, and if you are in the red area, uh, there may have actually been increases. So essentially the progress has actually happened throughout the world. And there are just a few examples, being in the Western Hemisphere, uh, particularly notable the uh, problems uh, in uh, Venezuela, where we've actually seen an increase of about 30 percent Last year. One of the champions, you may or may not know, one of the champions of the malaria, past malaria eradication campaign, one of the global leaders was a Venezuelan malariologist by the name of Gabaldon, the Maestro Gabaldon, as he uh, was referred to, who basically achieved the elimination of malaria in Venezuela during the eradication campaign. Uh, wherever he is, he would not be very happy to see the current state of uh, malaria today in, in, in Venezuela. Uh, Place that we do need to, to, to pay uh, attention to. The number of cases averted and deaths averted, uh, my colleague has already alluded to, the estimated 4.3 million uh, um, uh, deaths averted since 2000, uh, 670 million fewer cases uh, of malaria, and again, uh, uh, a demonstration of the uh, massive uh, um, uh, achievements of, of, the, of, the, of the last decade. Now, what are these achievements due to? Well, the right thing to say is, and probably surely true, uh, the scale up of uh, our core intervention. So on the left-hand side, 
um, you are seeing something that you should not be seeing right now uh, because this was supposed to be an animated graph. Um, and, uh, and in your left hand side, you were supposed to see uh, what the um, uh, coverage of ITNs was in the year 2000. And, um, uh, and it would be uh, essentially uh, close to zero throughout most of uh, Sub Saharan Africa. And on your right hand side, you were supposed to see what the prevalence of infection as a surrogate or a measure of uh, intensity of transmission and level of endemicity would be like. And what you would be seeing in the year 2000 was large parts of sub-Saharan Africa in yellow and reddish color uh, showing a significantly high transmission throughout most of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, if uh, the animation had worked well, I would be pressing the button and you would be seeing how uh, from the year 2000 until the year 2005, not much happened in terms of scaling up of bed nets, which only really t took uh, um, uh, off by the year 2005 and has been uh, significantly growing since then to end up with this picture where uh, coverage has uh, very significantly increased in a good number of, um, of uh, of countries. Um, and on the right hand side you would be seeing how the prevalence of infection has actually been decreasing over the last 13 years. I would have actually pointed out to you something and that is that the drops in the prevalence of infection as a marker of transmission intensity predate the scale up of some of the interventions or in this case of ITNs. And therefore, it is a reminder that we need to exercise some caution in not to attribute all the gains that we've witnessed to the deployment of, in this case, bedmets. And if we don't entirely understand all the drops that we've witnessed, we should not be surprised to see some increases, as we are actually seeing in some parts of southern and eastern Africa over the last couple of years in, in malaria incidents. Nonetheless, the figure of 2013 shows that large parts of sub-Saharan Africa have very low levels of parasite prevalence and therefore of transmission, including some of what has often been termed the heartland of malaria and demicity. And basically, three areas stick out. Uh, still in red, showing high parasite prevalences, high transmission. Western Africa, uh, including some of the Ebola affected countries. Uh, still some pockets in Central Africa. And then Northern Mozambique. That is where we still have our highest transmission intensity areas in, in Africa. So, Coverage of bed nets, as my colleague has uh, said, has increased, uh, really taking off in year 2005. It's a big success story, but uh, half, uh, glass half uh, full, still about 50% of households are not covered with effective vector control in Africa. Indoor residual spraying, um, a, a certain tendency to plateau, and even at some points uh, 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 decreasing good complement to uh, IRS, uh, to LLINs, and we are challenged in WHO to support the Global Fund and generally countries as to how to prioritize where should um, IRS uh, be uh, deployed versus where should LLINs be deployed. Is there room or need for the combination of both vector control approaches, and if so, where? What is the impact of one of uh, the biggest challenges? The one, the one thing that does keep us awake. At, well, in fact, it doesn't keep me awake because very few things keep me awake other than PASA. But um, what insecticide resistance, uh, a massively, I think, unrecognized problem. The one that has the potential to really derail all the gains that we've achieved in the last decade. This is just showing how resistant prevalence. Uh, 
um, of uh, resistance to the different classes of uh, insecticides commonly used both in insecticide nets and uh, IRS has been increasing, reaching in some parts of Africa pretty alarming levels, uh, especially so if we recognize that we don't have active ingredients uh, or active compounds that could potentially substitute these failing insecticides in the short term and understanding the implications of insecticide resistance in public health remains a challenge. There is a fair amount of work that going on, most of it actually being carried out by WHO. By the end of this year, we will have a much better indication of the uh, potential magnitude or impact of insecticide resistance on, on, on malaria, but certainly a very, very worried IPTP, my colleague, has done a, uh, a compelling presentation. It, is, uh, it has become a mantra for us uh, in the last few months. This is a simple, cost-saving, life-saving intervention um, that uh, implies the administration of a stat dose of SP, um, ideally uh, up to four times during pregnancy, making use of existing health contacts between the target population and the health services. Um, it does reduce maternal um, uh, anemia. It does reduce uh, placental infection. It does uh, subsequently reduce uh, uh, low birth weight prematurity and therefore two of the key drivers of neonatal mortality and we are not doing very well. Uh, uh, we are obsessed about all these failed or missed opportunities where the contact between the target population and the health system takes place but uh, the interventions are not delivered. What are all the determinants? Why of all these bottlenecks? We are not entirely clear. Personally, I think that it partly is because it falls between the malaria program, the antenatal services, the API system, and no one really takes full ownership of this simple intervention. And uh, we are committed uh, to support efforts, and certainly UNICEF is a, a champion in this, in how do we actually scale up IPTP uh, throughout the endemic part of, of Africa. As we speak of this, elimination is the other big word. 19 countries are in the process of uh, uh, pre-elimination or elimination in uh, basically all uh, uh, continents. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, where we are, hopefully this year, Argentina will be certified malaria-free. It is the first country in the Western Hemisphere to be certified malaria-free since the mid-1960s, uh, something that we should celebrate. Hopefully next year, Paraguay could potentially be certified malaria-free. Central America is making major steps forward. Costa Rica, I think, had two cases or four cases of malaria last year. El Salvador, about 10. There is no reason why Central America should not eliminate malaria by 2020. And the dream of a malaria-free Western Hemisphere uh, leading the global effort uh, is one that uh, would remain very, does remain very uh, close to my, my heart. Funding, uh, great progress. Again, since the year 2005 uh, up to the year 2013, uh, you won't be able to see uh, from the back. I cannot even read it from here. Um, but essentially, the different sources of uh, funding. Uh, a continuous increase with a certain tendency to plateau over the last um, uh, few years um, and uh, totaling um, um, uh, close to 2.5, 2.6 billion dollars uh, made available for malaria control last year, 2013. If we look at the breakdown between domestic funding and international assistance or ODA for the African continent and other WHO regions, we notice that um, the biggest, uh, the, the, there is still a massive uh, 
uh, disproportion between the ODA, uh, the, the external support versus the domestic funding in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. That uh, uh, ratio is smaller uh, in uh, areas outside Sub-Saharan Africa, but to me the negative message of this uh, um, uh, graph is that over the last 10 years, domestic funding in Sub-Saharan Africa has not really increased, and nor has it increased in, um, in uh, countries outside, outside Africa. Some of these countries, remember, six out of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some of the most powerful economies are uh, sitting in this place. There is something that we are not entirely understanding, and we're not doing well, if we cannot get those countries to really mobilize their own domestic resources. My guess is that as we look over the next 15 years and the type of resources that we will be requiring, most of them will need to come from domestic uh, funding. My guess is that no one's going to pay for uh, Brazil to eliminate its malaria or, uh, quite frankly, for India let alone for China, and let alone for some of the fastest growing economies in, in, in the world. They, they will need to, to pay for this. And understanding the mechanisms of how to uh, unleash domestic uh, funding, I believe, is going to be critical for us moving forward. So just a few uh, facts, and you've heard a lot about this. Still half of the population at risk. Um, uh, uh, do not have uh, an ITN. Still 15 million pregnant women do not receive IPTP. We must absolutely correct this uh, scandalous figure. Um, still 60 million children do not receive, are not diagnosed. 60 million cases of malaria are go undiagnosed and untreated. When we rightly so place a lot of attention to the problem of artemisinin resistance or multi-drug resistance, there is no worse case than actually the fact, actually recognizing that 60 million cases of malaria go untreated. Not with a drug which may have resistance, with no drug whatsoever. We need to correct that. So, what is WHO and the broader uh, community uh, uh, proposing? Over the last couple of years, we've been working to develop the so-called global technical strategy for malaria to give ourselves from the, to cover the 2016-2030 uh, uh, period. Why do we need a new uh, strategy? Well, uh, still over three billion people continue to be at risk of, of, of infection and, and disease. Um, and we are therefore still far away from uh, 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 regional and certainly global uh, uh, eradication. Uh, major global commitment is needed to continue scaling up the interventions and, and uh, close the, the, the gap, the unfinished agenda, which remains uh, uh, massive as we tackle the two key biological threats that we face, drug resistance and insecticide resistance. We believe that new guidance is needed to, to address the heterogeneity of, of malaria transmission and endemicity. Uh, the, the, we often use the sentence, uh, there is no one size fit all approach in malaria. Uh, we need to stratify. We need to understand the, um, the um, heterogeneity, the variability, and adapt our responses to uh, the changing epidemiology of, of malaria. And therefore, uh, we believe uh, further guidance uh, uh, would be needed. The next few years may be years in which we uh, realize the promise of new transformative tools for uh, malaria um, control. Uh, and not just tools, but uh, new strategies and approaches of using the new and the old tools to uh, um, uh, accelerate in, an, in our effort towards elimination, and that will include certainly addressing the uh, issue of asymptomatic uh, infections. Finally, in a world where we have, we will have SDGs and all sorts of targets and indicators, 
We believe that having a clear vision with goals for the post-2015 period uh, would be a useful exercise. As such, we have developed, uh, following a very intense process of consultation and engagement with broader community and, most importantly, with the countries themselves, a, um, a global technical strategy for, for uh, uh, malaria. Um, this would, should help prepare the ground for an accelerated effort with a renewed focus on, on elimination. Um, and uh, it urges endemic countries, donors, and stakeholders to maximize the impact of existing tools and strategies until new and improved tools become uh, available. Um, Builds on five core principles, which are not intended to just be politically correct or pay lip service, but uh, really root our strategies around the concept that all countries, irrespective at which level of endemicity they are, can actually accelerate towards um, uh, um, uh, elimination. Secondly, country ownership, a much used word, uh, but often um, uh, there will be no elimination of malaria in any country if it's not actually done by the country themselves. And uh, I know this sounds phenomenally obvious, but practice uh, tells us time and time again how there is a certain tendency to actually bypass um, uh, governments or national malaria control um, uh, programs on the grounds that they're not very well performing or um, or uh, there's a history of mismanagement of resources and so on. We need to try to help them fix that problem. But there will be no elimination, there will be no real progress if this is actually not owned by countries. And I'm happy to see here Justin Cohen from uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative because I think they fully endorse and embrace that notion and that's why they actually work by embedding people into the country programs themselves to actually help them become more functional and better performance and we applaud that effort. Third key uh, building principle is we need surveillance, monitoring and evaluation. Believe me, it is slightly embarrassing when we, uh, I'll tell you here, uh, um, and we won't tell the folks out there, but when we present our World Malaria Report and we present all these figures and so on, let us just be clear, most of it is the product of modeling we still don't have real data. And most importantly, countries don't have real data for them to primarily use it for better planning, progress tracking, and adapting their own strategies. The next few years must be about generating data in country, primarily for the use of the country itself. The fourth is equity in access to services, especially for the most vulnerable and hard to reach populations. Elimination will not happen, and this is a key mantra for us now in the greater Mekong sub-region, a focus of our work to uh, support an elimination effort in that region. If um, we don't provide free medical care to the migrant, mobile, displaced population without the risk of retaliation or deportation, it will simply not happen. Uh, if we don't tackle that. So uh, uh, reaching that, uh, those populations will be uh, important. And finally, innovation. And I think it is very important on a, that on a WHO document, we fully, on a new strategy for malaria, we recognize uh, that we will not make the mistake that was made in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 60s, in the first malaria eradication campaign, where someone, an illustrious, uh, malariologists later on, well, the malaria eradication campaign failed to eradicate malaria, but nearly succeeded in eradicating malaria research. Um, we cannot afford to make that mistake. We need the products of innovation throughout the process of accelerating um, uh, to improve control and elimination. Strategy builds on three blocks, what we call pillar one, ensuring universal access to malaria prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, the core WHO recommended by their interventions. Pillar two, how do we adapt strategies to accelerate towards elimination and attainment of a malaria free status. And the pillar three is really making, transforming malaria surveillance into a core intervention itself to support the elements. Uh, uh, 
one, harnessing innovation and expanding research, and secondly, uh, strengthening the enabling environment, which is not just about advocacy, it's about the regulatory environment, many other things that need to happen in a country for us to be able to move forward. Our vision contained in the global technical strategy is a world free of malaria. As we said, this is not different to what was said in 1955 and uh, in many ways retained in the 1968 World Health Assembly. We do envision a, a, a eradication of malaria, a malaria-free world. Um, our targets for 2030 is that um, we will have reduced by at least 90% disease and death. That at least 35 new countries will have actually eliminated malaria and we will have avoided re-establishment of transmission in those countries where malaria has been eliminated. Um, and then we uh, wanted to make five years uh, um, milestones to allow us to track progress. And uh, frankly speaking, uh, for us, uh, the 2030 uh, uh, targets are very important, but we want to focus on, on, uh, on, on the 2020 ones, because that's what we need to achieve in the next five years. And that calls for a reduction of at least 40% in disease and death due to malaria, and at least 10 new countries having uh, eliminated malaria. Now, you may rightly ask yourself, are these the type of aspirational goals that were often included in the uh, MDGs? Um, more to mobilize resources, to act as advocacy pieces rather than real data? Well, this was a very deliberate decision that was taken at the very beginning of the process. No. They are not aspirational. They're not to be um, advocacy pieces, but actually rooted in real data. So let me just sort of share the approach that has been followed in developing these, these targets. First of all, a review of the trends in malaria cases and deaths in the period 2000 2012, and what would happen if we actually continued in that line of progression. Secondly, a review of the targets that national malaria control programs have actually established themselves. This is not us telling them, this is what they actually did. And thirdly, mathematical modeling, modeling on, uh, and this specifically just on, on fensipro malaria. Now, if you just bear with me a couple of extra minutes, um, um, so sorry, just to say, I mean, the, somehow the triangulation of all these elements is what gives rise to the the, the, the targets that you've just uh, seen. Using currently available tools. In other words, we believe that these may actually be conservative estimates because they don't factor in the potential impact of the tools that we hope to have within the next five years or so. A um, couple of different scenarios, or four different scenarios. What happens if we just sustain the current coverage rates at the current levels? What would happen if we actually scaled up to about 80%? What would happen if we actually scaled up to about 90%? And what would happen if we actually went back to the 2007 coverage levels? Now the reason to show this graph, which is not contained in the global technical strategy, although there is wording that alludes to this, is that this is clinical malaria and this is more time. If and, and the basic me message, which we suspect is right, is if we just remain where we are today with the type of coverage levels that we've achieved up to now, and this great scale up that we've seen, what we should expect is actually an increase in malaria and in, an increase in mortality over the coming years. If we actually revert to the 2007 levels, this is what we should expect, a massive rebound both in disease and death. To me, the take home message is there is no option of staying where we are. We simply just have to accelerate because staying where we are will actually take us back. So we need to pedal faster because pedaling at the speed of the, which we're pedaling will make us fall. However, if we accelerate and increase coverage to 80%, these are the gains that we could achieve. And if we accelerate it to 90%, these are the gains that we could achieve. So this strategy has been completed. It's a relatively short document. 
has gone through uh, a very intense uh, process of consultation, which has been important because it has led to significant ownership by countries and regions. It has gone through um, the executive board this uh, past January with very strong support from countries. Um, and uh, veterans tell me pretty unprecedented support um, that was witnessed last January. And we're looking forward to this being uh, formally endorsed uh, by uh, countries in, uh, in the World Health Assembly that will start in Geneva in, in just a, a few weeks uh, uh, from now. We hope to have a, a side event uh, organized by a good number of countries, South Africa, China, Thailand, uh, uh, Mozambique, uh, uh, Brazil, and others uh, to uh, celebrate the launching of this uh, um, uh, new strategy, as well as uh, launching the new uh, regional innovation <coughs> strategy for the greater uh, Mekong sub-region. So let me stop here. Let me thank you for the opportunity of sharing all this data. Uh, we all share the passion for malaria. We all uh, share the need uh, to work in partnership. And particularly, the partnership with UNICEF is a very dear uh, unneeded one uh, from us at WHO. Uh, WHO is only one part of, of, of the larger uh, group of people and institutions that need to work together to eventually uh, imagine and uh, hopefully realize a, a world free of clarity. Thanks uh, very much for the bird eye view on the situation and also the strategy for the coming years. Um, just picking up on what you mentioned, importance of domestic budgets. Uh, this week, as you may know, member states are negotiating the outcome document for uh, financing for development and we very much hope and uh, together with WHO other partners to be able also to make the pitch for the investment case on health, education, protection, other areas that are important uh, as we prepare jointly for Addis Abeba. Um, and you mentioned in your final word the importance of partnerships, and that's our next topic. Uh, welcome very much, Elizabeth Fox. She is the director of the Office of Health, Infectious Diseases and Nutrition in USAID's Bureau for Health. And uh, without further ado, give you the word. Please, welcome. Thank you, Christian, and thank you all. I'm, I'm really thrilled that I could be here today to talk about partnerships. And I think, Pedro, your presentation shows the importance of partnerships and the importance of us all being under a same mission and goal in this. Um, happy to be here with WHO, to be here with UNICEF and Chicago and NGOs here and lots of other partners. Um, I'm also honored to represent USAID and the President's Malaria Initiative, which has been an amazing partnership. Um, and it's worked because it's really grounded. And it's worked because it's grounded starting with the countries. Things aren't going to work if we're not starting with the countries. We've seen that in terms of the need for domestic resource mobilization. We've seen it with the need for true partnership. But also there are a lot of other partners out there in the Global Fund and WHO and UNICEF and NGOs. We pretty much partner with everything except the mosquito. And we might do that someday. Um, Thanks to these partnerships, we really are making progress. I think we've seen that today with your data. Thank you. Um, it's impressive, but it's also scary because we could lose that momentum. And that's why partnerships are so necessary. And we still have a big problem. And we have a big problem, especially for women and children. Uh, not only women and children, but the poorest of the poor. And that's who malaria is affected by. Um, despite all the progress we've seen, we still have a large amount of under five mortality. Three quarters of that mortality is preventable, and it's preventable with things we know how to do. Um, di uh, diarrhea, pneumonia, malaria, newborn death, low birth weight, these are all preventable in many ways. Um, malaria is probably the easiest, and it's what makes us mad is when we look at the prevention and the techniques that are out there, and the fact that some of these are not accessed. Um, especially the issue of low birth weight. Um, we have tools. We have simple tools. We have proven tools. We have tools that are acceptable. Um, why isn't it happening? 
I think this is a question that bedevils us all. Um, you talk about access, and we see these very impressive figures on actually women going to get antenatal care but not getting IPTP. Um, really good question. Um, and I think as a partnership, we don't have the answers. Um, what we do know, and we're beginning to see, also through partnerships, is that the solution to a lot of these questions or these doubts isn't really at the service level. It's probably at the community level. And it's probably at a level of beliefs and behaviors and the work of community health workers and community members um, which are also our partners. Um, and that's why I think it's important today to also pay attention to the amazing work that's been done with the integrated community case management work, um, especially around malaria, and how that's been used to work to get many of these essential interventions to the people who need them the most. Um, these are preventive measures that can be accessed in a lot of cases without access to services. And the fact that community health workers and communities mobilizing on their own can do a lot makes a big difference. Um, the ICCM is a great example of partnerships. And uh, PMI has been working a lot with that, and so has USAID. Um, and we see that in terms of the work with community health workers in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in Senegal, in Malawi. Some of the countries where we've got real progress, we can really see the impact of working through communities and working through community health workers. Um, you need different partners to think differently about strategies. Um, and you need different partners to do different things. And I think that's one of the things we're going to see with the strategy going forward. To achieve these goals, we do have to be all pedaling that bicycle really fast, but we do different parts of it. And seeing how those different parts come together is an important work to do, and it's an important work to have under a general framework. The fact that some partners are better at the community level, some are working fixing supply chains, some are working on commodities, some are looking at what's happening with women and access to services. Different partners do different things, and USAID certainly works in many ways through PMI and through all our partners with those different functions. For example, in 2014, last year, um, USAID and PMI trained 85,000 community health workers. It's a lot of community health workers, especially thinking of all the people that those people will reach. Um, and that's on administering diagnostics and preventive therapies. Um, they don't just do that. When you speak to a woman, when you go into a house in a village, you talk about a lot of different things. And you also have a different message in terms of what health is all about, um, how you can address a lot of your own health issues at an individual level or a community level, and how some of these behaviors and some of these beliefs around providers, for example, are very deeply rooted in communities. Um, we've all seen that, we've all seen that recently, and I think it's why working with community health workers and working at the community level is a real advance in that. Um, ICCM is a great partnership, it's not the only one we work in. Um, as I said, we work with every partner except mosquitoes. Um, the Newborn Action Plan, I think, which is very closely tied with uh, um, a, sort of the goals of what we're talking about today and the group that's here, is another fabulous partnership. Um, it wouldn't have been written without all the partners here present and many more, and it wouldn't have been adopted at the World Health Assembly. So we're grateful for that and grateful for that partnership. Um, this plan allows us to work together to build platforms, lots of different platforms. It also helps us on the monitoring and evaluation. And I think that's where our data will start being real data. Um, we can move beyond modeling in many cases. When we start working with countries themselves on scorecards, uh, when we have the type of data that actually tracks progress on these different interventions and can be applied more strategically to help us adjust our work along the way. Um, modeling data is great, it gets us energized, it makes us look for the future. It doesn't solve your day-to-day -day problems on what you change. And so I think working um, with scorecards and the platforms from the Every Newborn Action Plan is gonna make a big difference. Um, and it looks at simple actions. It looks at actions like behaviors and it looks at actions that work with newborns, 
breastfeeding, washing your hands, kangaroo <coughs> care, things that are part of saving a newborn life and also are going to reduce deaths and newborn deaths across the board. Um, working in partnership um, is what we do. We also, for lots of reasons, um, because we're impatient, because we've seen this happen before, because of pressures from outside, we keep a pretty relentless eye on impact. And I think we all have to hold ourselves to that. As a partnership, we can't just be happy together. We also have to hold ourselves accountable. And I think that's one of the, one of the real points of convergence around having an overarching vision and having a strong partnership statement. Um, I think only through that are we going to reach that grand convergence, be it 2030, 2035, um, where every woman and every child um, has an equal chance, an equal shot at a healthy life and a productive life. And malaria and its impact on health, on behavior, and on economies is going to play a very important role in that. And that's why I'm so pleased to be here today to speak about partnerships. Thank you. So thank you, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you know a lot of the successes, uh, the great successes achieved, uh, was due to the country ownership, to the decisive government's decisions, but then due to the partnerships around it. Without that, we all know that nobody can achieve. And also for the future, that will be a decisive, and that's. Nice swing into Valentina uh, Buch's like uh, presentation about the challenges because there are still, as we have heard also from industry, a lot of challenges. Um, in UNICEF, uh, at least we say that uh, like reaching the last 10 percent, so to speak, we're not even in that situation, um, is probably harder than you know reaching the first say, 80 or 90 percent of, of children who whatever service. So. The challenges are huge still, and uh, my colleague, the global advisor on uh, malaria, Valentina, will talk to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christian. I won't need to reintroduce myself. I'm Valentina Wolf, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being UNICEF's global malaria advisor. So, as I think everyone has presented, the big problem with malaria is that it is very much a disease of the poor and it is poor rural women who are the most disadvantaged and those that we are having the hardest time getting access, ensuring that they have access to intermittent preventive treatment and to bed nets. I think everyone's talked a lot about this, so I'm going to give you a couple of numbers. The problem is not just that it's 125 million women who become pregnant every year, and the number is so high because as Pedro reminded us, India is also a malaria endemic country, and so a lot of women are becoming pregnant and are exposed to the malaria parasite. And as also has been discussed, the problem is that it's not just the women who die and their newborns who die, it's when you're born low birth weight, those effects are long lasting. It's a developmental problem that can affect you your entire life. <laughs> it affects your chance of thriving, it, it affects your access, it affects everything that will happen to you later in life. We've discussed that there's actually four malaria in pregnancy and scaling it up, there's two different arms. There's bed nets and there's IPTP, so I'll start with bed nets. Pregnant women are really reached best through routine systems, and for that we need strong health systems. UNICEF supports bed net distributions at antenatal care and also at immunization contact points. UNICEF is also doing a lot of support for mass campaigns, which sometimes nets pregnant women, pun intended, but it is not sufficient, and I'll tell you a couple of numbers in a minute. We have a long way to go. I think Pedro did a beautiful job of sort of saying we have opportunities, we've come a long way, but if we take our eye off the ball, we're going to go into a huge sequence of problems. Evidence has shown that of the 75 documented malaria resurgences, the majority are linked to decreased funding. And this little curve scares me. These, the decreases in funding hit pregnant women particularly hard. A case in point for me that was very close to home is in Madagascar, the coverage of pregnant women under nets was 72% in 2011, but by 2013 it had decreased to 61%. And this isn't the only country. Other countries that have seen similar drops are Niger, Kenya, and Nigeria. And many of these are linked to decreases in funding. 
So if we're going to talk about IPTP, I thank Elizabeth for really setting the stage that it is about partnerships. Pedro also said it, IPTP is the lonely stepchild because it, it sometimes falls between the cracks of reproductive health and malaria. Both of them say, oh, no, 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 the other group will take care of it. And if we don't focus on really having partnerships working across nutrition, HIV, health system strengthening, and communications, and as Pedro said, showing the impact of that partnership, we're not going to get the focus scale up that we need. Like Vessi showed the problems that we're seeing here and the horrifying statistic that only 23% of African women are receiving the recommended dosage. When you combine this with low levels of LLIN coverage of, amongst pregnant women, we really are missing an opportunity to protect women and to scale up and move on those first steps towards malaria elimination. It's cheap. This is what really scares me. It is very, very cheap. The full four doses of IPTP cost less than 50 cents. If you already have an existing AMC platform to add IPTP, it's $1.10. How many of you bought coffee this morning? I had to pay a lot more than $1.10 this morning. So it really is an incredibly missed opportunity. And bed nets, we have an extraordinary opportunity. Bed nets, including delivery now, are about $5. Again, less than that specialty coffee this morning. So if we could really work on spending less on coffee and more on IPTP and bed nets, I think we could reach a historic achievement. For me, what's incredibly important is a bed net, it lasts for two to three years. So we're not only covering that pregnant woman, we're covering her newborn and possibly her second child at that particular point. So it really is an incredible opportunity. Challenges. We like challenges in UNICEF. Again, here the problem is, who's, who's going to take care of it? Everyone says the National Malaria Control Program, then we push back to the reproductive health, and we're sort of pushing back and forth. But at the end of the day, it's the woman who has to walk to that health facility. It's the woman who has to sit there and then be sent home with no IPTP. Part of those are barriers because she's poor. So if we're not giving the service for free, or we haven't paid for this 50 cents of four doses to be free, she can't access it. So the problems really are about money, but sometimes, oops, move too fast. But sometimes it's also getting to the community, passing on messages, ensuring that there are no taboos about a pregnant woman going to a health facility by herself, ensuring that she has information about how many doses, what are her rights, incentivizing community health workers. So we have to ensure that community health workers are retrained. And again, I thank Elizabeth for saying that we trained 85,000 health workers. We still need to ensure that they're well trained and that they understand and that they have the drugs at their disposal. We also have to train them on quantification. Much of the data that I collected for this presentation from country offices, they said, you know what, the problem was we had enough to give maybe one or two doses when we have to go to four. We don't have enough drug. We didn't do the numbers right. So again, we need to go back to that community level and make sure that we're getting their data. Pedro says it, and it's our mantra, surveillance, reporting, data, and feedback loops. Ensure that it's the community who knows what to do with the data that we're collecting. This is a problem that gets to me quite a few times because yes, universal coverage is incredibly important and so are campaigns, <coughs> but you can't take my routine nuts. You can't disadvantage people. So, so often the campaigns come through and they will just say, okay, We've got these nets, we're supposed to be distributing them next year for pregnant women and their kids. We'll put them in the universal coverage campaign and, and our numbers are set. But the next year there's pregnant women who were by themselves, who weren't married or maybe not pregnant, and they don't have the opportunity to get a bed net. So we really, again, need to make quantification. And again, that dedicated financing for malaria and pregnancy intervention, which are IPT and the bed nets, and don't take my routine bed nets. So I thought I would show you what it feels like for a pregnant woman when she's pregnant to have one.
I'm going to finish that story in a little minute. So, so long as you could read what she was saying. And what I love about that clip is that she says, my life was not over. I might have had malaria, but my life was not over. So what are we going to do going forward? We have a lot of opportunities and we have priorities, but amongst them I would like you to really keep in mind that we're going into a resource-constrained environment, which means we need to ensure and focus on vulnerable populations. We need to ensure that we're looking at every opportunity, which in involves expanding the delivery base. We're going to have to think innovatively, think about using public, private, and faith-based health facilities. Sustainable financing. The Global Fund has changed to a new funding model, which tells me I should have some ideas about how much money is coming. But I still need to ensure that that's being dedicated and going towards these vulnerable populations. And we need to do outreach activities. Again, that partnership at the community level between community health workers and supply chains and procurement systems are well aligned to get to this community level. We also need to ensure communications, which means proving that when we do this outreach, we are reducing ignorance and stigma, and we have to think about incentives. There has to be an incentive for a woman to walk those five, 10 miles to the health facility. We have to ensure the community health worker is there and is trained and can help her. And to that end, I think we need to start thinking about M Health. M Health is really a very good way. There are incentive, there are opportunities and there are initiatives to send out SMS to remind a woman when she's supposed to come for her ANC. But the other thing that UNICEF is working on is quantifying and saying, look, you can tell when a clinic is stopped out. You can send information back to the capitals to say, this health facility didn't have any drugs. Please send us more supplies. There's 6.2 million phones in Africa. It's the fastest growing rate, fastest growing coverage rate of mobile phone use in the world. I think we need to really use that opportunity. So let's sustain some gains. What is working? See, Chris just telling me his phone is working. I need to get that working for pregnant women as well. We talk about partnerships, and I think we really do need to ensure that that continues forward. We have an incredible comparative advantage. We have ability to deliver on the ground. We can use these partnerships. We have right now a UNICEF Global Fund MOU, which is focused not only on community health, but also on the maternal platform. We need to leverage that to ensure that we're delivering. And we can also use maternal and child health weeks. It's a fantastic opportunity to really use that campaign mechanism, not to steal the routine meds, but to deliver drugs and to deliver bed meds. And this is what we stand to gain. This for us is incredibly important. We can reduce low birth weight. We can reduce perinatal and neonatal mortality. We can save more mother's lives, which will save their children's lives. And we can start these steps on the road to malaria elimination, as Pedro pointed out. So I'm going to finish Sabine's story for you. short of time now, so I think uh, we have one more speaker. That's uh, 
uh, Elaine Roman from the HPI EGO's malaria team, the lead of the team, and also I understand co chair of the working group on worldwide malaria and pregnancy. Kind of taking off from where Valentina just ended, uh, please, the words for you. Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure for me to be able to be here today with all of you to talk about the global rollback malaria call to action for intermittent preventive treatment. I am so honored to be speaking with this esteemed panel and um, it is really for myself who's been working in malaria and pregnancy with many of you over the years um, to see the commitment now and the partnership coming together um, to raise awareness uh, around what we need to do to move malaria and pregnancy forward is so, so important. Um, let me just mention up front very, very quickly a little bit about how this call to action came to be. And we've heard a lot already about the burden and the reality of where we are today with malaria and pregnancy. And in November of last year at the American Society for Trout Med and Hygiene Conference, a number of global and country level stakeholders came together in a seminar to really initiate this call. And from that time, um, a group including um, the Malaria and Pregnancy Consortium, uh, Chipayago, the London School for Trout Med and Hygiene, worked very closely with the World Health Organization and a number of other partners to get us here today in time to launch this call. So, I included two facts up here, two sobering facts, and in fact, Pedro's talked about them, Valentina's talked about them, I think we heard about them in the, uh, the first uh, presentation as well, but I think they're worth reinforcing. These are sobering facts. The 2014 World Re Malaria Report states that 15 million women of 35 million did not receive one dose of IPTP in 2013. That is unacceptable. We have to do more and we have to do better. We heard also that up to 200,000 infants are estimated to have died as a result of malaria and pregnancy. And, I, and again, as Pedro said, these lives could have been saved between 2009 and 2012 if we had achieved the RBM target goals for 2010, which incidentally were at 60%. But even with those facts, even with where we are with the burden today, now is the time there is real opportunity to turn the tide for malaria and pregnancy, and we can do more. It will take partnership and commitment from countries to make sure that the WHO 2012 recommendation for IPTP is realized, not just through policies, but also through successful implementation. We also need to commit and support health system strengthening, especially antenatal care, uh, where most women are coming to receive IPTP. As we push forward to achieve uh, in the final steps towards the Millennium Development Goals, this needs to continue to be a prioritization, and also as we move forward to the Sustainable Development Goal number six in the future. So every call to action has a plan and a time frame. And I want to remind us too, and we've heard this this morning already, malaria and pregnancy is a maternal and newborn health issue. That is clear. And so the ultimate goal of this call to action is to ensure that the adverse outcomes of malaria and pregnancy are eliminated. And we're going to do that by increasing IBT coverage. And let me say, that doesn't mean that we're ignoring net coverage. We're not. But if you look at the trends in net coverage and you compare them to the trends in IPT coverage, there is quite a remarkable difference. So we really need to push forward for IPT. I won't go through all of this, but a key next step is really going to be gaining buy-in, gaining support, commitment from countries to accelerate this further at country level, on top of what they're already doing. 
and achieving by our target by 2030 that at least 90% coverage uh, with three or more doses of IPT in areas of stable malaria transmission. So over the next few slides, I just want to quickly talk about a few of the select recommendations that the call to action makes among a variety of stakeholders. Um, some of these have been discussed already, um, and I'm not going to mention all of them on each slide in the interest of time. There has been so there has been a lot of valid and important points around partnership, and I'm so glad to hear Elizabeth talk about partnerships. It is absolutely critical for malaria and pregnancy. As a maternal and newborn health issue, it is reproductive health programs that need to carry the flag and push this forward. And yet malaria is largely funded through malaria programs. So supporting and strengthening these partnerships at country level to ensure that planning is coordinated and efforts are not duplicated is absolutely critical at this time. Also, exploring alternative opportunities for the delivery of IPT in communities where uh, antenatal care may be hard to reach or as an extension of antenatal care. At the donor level, I talked about health system strengthening, that continued commitment to strengthen health systems and especially around antenatal care, as well as promoting the inclusion of IPT in grant proposals. We should be expecting in endemic countries where malaria exists that IPT, malaria and pregnancy, is included in that proposal. Not just for improving malaria outcomes, but for ensuring that pregnant women and their newborns have better lives. In the research community, validating findings, validating what we know works. There are a number of country success stories in the malaria and pregnancy community, but they're usually typically in smaller pocketed geographic zones. And so these need to be validated with further research so that they can be replicated, so that they can be scaled up, so that we can achieve coverage. As well, and linking back to what I said on the first slide, it's evaluating those alternative strategies for the delivery of IPT in harder, reach to in harder to reach populations and communities. In the pharmaceutical industry, um, meeting the demand for SP, we know with the new recommendation that we need more SP, and this was discussed in Valentina Valentina made this point as well. It's also affected by many countries are now supporting seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis, which uses SP as well. So the supply is limited. We need to ensure that the availability is there at antenatal care clinics. In civil society, advocacy and promotion for the importance of IPT, as well as holding governments accountable in, in their countries to deliver IPT to pregnant women. So I wanted to share one, well, I wanted to share many <laughs> successful stories with you today, but in the interest of time, I'm going to share one, and it's about Ghana, because honestly, this day is about harnessing our power of working together, but it's also a celebration and what has come so far. So Ghana, um, I think many of you know, made a remarkable and notable increase in IPTP in a relatively short period of time. As background, Ghana adopted a three-dose policy of IPT in 2004, and they adopted a three-dose policy was, which was unique to most African countries at the time. Um, the only other country that did that was Zambia. Um, they did that because of the high prevalence of HIV. And then over a three year period, they increased, or IPT uptake increased, this is two doses of IPT from 44% to 65%. In addition, Ghana has very high rates, or has higher rates of four or more visits of antenatal coverage. 
and this is important because while most women in sub-Saharan Africa, and we heard this earlier as well, will come for at least one visit and often two visits, the numbers really decline after that second visit as we know. So Ghana had this really unique backdrop. It had a frequent dosing policy of three doses, and in addition, it had fuller coverage of antenatal care, or comprehensive coverage of ANC. So the question was, well then, what did Ghana do against that backdrop to actually increase IPT? And we reached out and we spoke with USAID, we spoke with PMI, we spoke with supporting partners, we spoke with the ministry, both the reproductive health team as well as the malaria team. And this is what we found. There were initially four um, key elements or key pieces to um, helping Ghana to increase IPT coverage. The first, and really the underpinning, was that partnership between reproductive health and malaria control. They worked together, they sat together to ensure that implementation was planned and coordinated, and more importantly, that efforts were not duplicated. The second piece was around increasing demand at community level. Focusing messages on increasing IPT uptake, but as well increasing ITN coverage and early antenatal care attendance. The third piece is the capacity development piece. And Ghana really did this in a comprehensive way and still has a focus on this in ensuring strengthening pre-service education at the national level in-service training at the district and facility level, and then following that up with mentoring or supportive supervision to providers. And the fourth piece, which they initially had a real challenge with, but it overcame, was ensuring the availability of SP at the antenatal care clinic, at the point of care, which required monitoring those stocks at facility level, district level, and national level. And unfortunately, I'd like to say this is obvious, but that is not done across many, many countries. We, are, we still are seeing stockouts of SP at antenatal care, and they sit in a warehouse at national level. Not acceptable. So it was these four pieces against the backdrop that they had that really helped to push Ghana forward. And what, I think this is really important for why we're here today. It's important because now countries have adopted, or most countries have adopted, the new frequent dosing policy. So now this is affording countries, or will afford countries as they move forward with implementation, the opportunity to increase uptake of IPT. I would like to encourage you all to go to the call to action site uh, through the link here. There's also a social media kit that promotes messages around this. Uh, we also have handouts, copies of the call to action on the table right uh, when you came in, so please pick one up. This is an advocacy document, and it's only going to be the more that we can push it, the more that we can um, uh, get the word out that we are going to be help to accelerate efforts going forward. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the organizations listed here, and one is the missing USA. Uh, but that's part of the President's Malaria Initiative. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, I would uh, like to close this meeting now. And uh, first of all, by thanking all the panelists uh, for joining us today. And uh, quite, uh, we haven't lost a lot of public, even though we went uh, a bit over time, which shows, you know, the commitment. And, and interest in the topic. Uh, thanks all for joining us. Um, uh, this whole meeting will be uploaded on YouTube, so you can can look at it or get back to some of the details or watch yourselves <laughs> if you want to. And uh, I would also like to reiterate the invitation at the beginning uh, that a lot of the data presented are on uh, data.unicef.org, so for those who really want to go to, to the data more, uh, please do visit uh, the website and then uh, even though uh, Valentina has urged us to spend less on coffee and more on malaria, I still uh, we are still offering some coffee uh, over there and some bites if you would like to. And again, thanks very much. And we have a lot to do in the coming years. We very much hope that really for Addis Ababa can only be and then also 
also for, for the SDGs and all the work that is really a lot of us, if not all, are you know, concerned with uh, not only the financial ask, the indicator work, etc., etc. There's a lot of going on right now and you know, need to stick together and work towards these common causes. Thank you very much.